Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 435. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 13th of September. It's the feast of St. John Chrysostom, who preached the gospel so beautifully. Uh, his friends and his uh, listeners called him Goldenmouth. Oh, that it should be done for us too. Okay, obviously we're, we're aged. Uh, and I'm going to give you my health update. Then we'll do Gavin's health tip update. And we'll talk a little about George. I've had the most awful week, Gavin. I've had okay. my 50-year-old my tests. I went to the eye doctor on Monday. They dilated me. I couldn't see. I couldn't drive. Had to have my son drive me home. <sighs> That's one test. On Tuesday, I had the <clears throat> colonoscopy test. And uh, th the joy of that is just, you know, beyond reason. Uh, and it just it blows your whole day. Um, no, no plumbing stories, Kevin. You no know, plumbing, plumbing stories whatsoever. <laughs> Wednesday morning, I went to a funeral of a friend. And then Wednesday afternoon, I, I went and had my teeth cleaned. And basically, I just take a chisel and go in there and uh, take care of my old teeth. But compared to my friends like you and George, they're minor. Uh, they're just annoyances, uh, except for the funeral. Uh, part of uh, growing old, you've had your hip replaced. How is that going? How, how are you feeling? Kevin, it's amazing. It, I, I mean, it's just wonderful. Um, I didn't realize how, how much pain I'd been in for the last two years, and I'm not in any pain now. Uh, a physiotherapist came to see me uh, to, to give me some exercises, and, and and then one thing she said was, climb mountains. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a mountain. I live on a mountain. And so I, I, I rather foolishly went for an, an uphill walk that was longer than I expected, and when I got to the top of it, I wasn't sure I was going to get get back down again. So um, I, 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 when it came to when it came to, to bedtime, I found myself. You know, I, I, it's probably happened to a number of people, but but my body was kind of so freaked out by it, it wouldn't go to sleep. So you know, what are you going to do next? <laughs> so I didn't fall asleep until about three o'clock in the morning. I, I bit off more than I could chew. No, but, but not for the first time. You life. use one of creation's greatest gifts, gravity and got back home and uh, <laughs> yes. it's helped me more than once too. <laughs> uh, on to George. Uh, George is still recovering. Um, uh, we were going to do a show today, but uh, his wife said, ah, you know, he's still recovering and stuff like that, but he's getting lots of rest. He goes back to work, uh, I think, sometime next week. But, you know, it's hard to teach some people to settle down, relax, and take a vacation. George doesn't take vacations. And this is probably his first real vacation forced upon him. Um, but you can tell by his text and talking that he has cabin fever. Yeah. So that's the, that's the health updates from the England Unscripted. Okay, Gavin, let's talk a little bit about the news. Um, first, there was a poll released over in England that said only 2% of young adults identify as Church of England attendees or members. And I said, well, obviously, if I called Justin Welby and asked him if this is a real number or what's going on, I'm not going to get a response. But I know you would tell me what's going on. What's this number about? Well, there's a demographic time bomb in England. Uh, mm -hmm. The average age of the congregations is, is, is about 68. Mm -hmm. um, numbers are falling very, very quickly. And as you look down the generations and say, what's coming next? The effects of secularism, secular education, the lack of evangelism mean that our kids don't know anything about Christianity. Very few of them go to church. And the Social Attitude Survey says that in terms of younger adults, only 2% say they have anything to do with the Church of England. Well, no, it's worse than that because having something to do with the Church of England or identifying as Church of England is not the same thing as going to worship or living a Christian lifestyle. So a much smaller percentage of the 2% would be active born again Christians. And essentially what this means is that there is no Church of England down the road. When this generation dies in the next five to 10 years, there's, there's, there's nothing left or, or very little left indeed. And what that suggests is the Church of England uh, needs to move from being an entitled established church with a long historic with a long historic um, uh, record to being a confessing evangelistic church set in the middle of a, of, of a hedonistic secular society evangelizing fit to bust because yeah. nobody knows about nobody knows about Jesus let alone let alone refusing him uh, they, they just don't know uh, and 
so if if one was um archbishop or or a, or a bishop i think in in the church of england the, the one of the first priorities would have to be evangelism well, but it, that doesn't seem to be the case in reality i can't think of any more fertile ground uh than the shores of britain uh the the people haven't heard of him for decades jesus um he's not you know there's you know it's a post-christian society in almost every way and i think there's a there would be a great advantage uh, uh to evangelism there next story i saw uh there is the longest acronym you could think of uh it starts with l uh are having more and more eucharists and uh and now it's wells cathedrals one of the reasons why there isn't any evangelism is because um, there is a sense uh, amongst those who, who are leading the Church of England that to be progressive or to be on the left, uh, both politically and morally, um, is, is, um, is, is kind of good enough. And so um, there's a, a, a great emphasis on, on welcoming victims uh, instead of evangelism. It's about uh, compassion for the broken in one sense this is of course there should be compassion for the broken but 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 it should be all broken yes <laughs> and not particularly <laughs> not 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 just people with problems with sexual identity um so for 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 all for the orthodox christians um the whole issue of the theology of sexuality uh and whether or not we accept scriptures uh, um interpretation of the issues is, is right at the heart of being a Christian. The Church of England has decided not to follow scripture, or as, as, as Bob Gagnon would say in, in, in his excellent theological works, to, to reinterpret scripture uh, willfully and, and in a way that is inconsistent with scripture and tradition, and um, make, um, make LGBTQIAA rights a, uh, a, a goal. Now, the, you might say that um, since the social surveys said that about 1.7% of the country uh, is homosexual, um, that, that really isn't a large enough, e even pragmatically, if you forget all the theology, that isn't a large enough group in society to, to make up uh, for, for the missing people. However, uh, cathedral after cathedral after cathedral is making a stand for LGBT rights and inviting in uh, the sexually confused, broken, and in orthodox terms, uh, of dubious practice. So recently, uh, the Bishop of Taunton, who is a woman and a suffragan bishop in the Diocese of Bath and Wells, is holding uh, an LGBT Eucharist in Wells Cathedral. Who is the bishop? The bishop is supposedly uh, somebody who was trained at one of our most evangelical orthodox seminaries, Peter Hancock at Oak Hill. Uh, if he is not able or willing to make any kind of stand so that his suffragan bishop feels this is an okay thing to do there aren't many in the in the church who are going to and so i think one has to say that that uh, symbolic moment after symbolic moment follows and the church of england dominoes are falling into the hands of this progressive movement now if you if you think that uh, affirming lgbt people in their sexuality is the right is the gospel and the kingdom then this is a very good thing if like me you think this is actually a, a deception from the other side and is is profoundly corrosive and spiritually very dangerous then it's absolutely disastrous mm, indeed now i've always been taught it only takes a, a generation for you know a, a government a society uh, a nation to go to hell and uh the previous generations was the Billy Graham generation, the uh, evangel evangelist who traveled around the world. He went to stadiums. He had altar calls. Uh, you know, in, in especially in the later days, uh, uh, had a very nurturing ministry of uh, of uh, evangelism. His son, Franklin Graham, is uh, not at all given the respect that his father was given. You know, it's, it's a generation later. And uh, here in America, uh, Franklin Graham is kind of respected a little bit, but the further away you go, I see disrespect, except for the nation of maybe, or the, uh, the continent of Africa. I saw over in England, 
the Muslims want to ban him from coming, and uh, so do the LGTBY acronym. Uh, have you heard this? Yes. Um, Billy Graham has become quite famous in the last few years because we've had a, a television program called The Crown. Ah, yes. And uh, the, the, the Crown has talked about the history of the, of the Queen and Prince Philip. It's had a lot of interesting things in it, but one of its most moving parts was the arrival of Billy Graham in the 19... Uh, I think it was 50s, but is it 60s? It must be in the 60s. Yes. Um, and The Crown faithfully... Um, set aside an episode to show how the queen welcomed him and and suggested as we as we know that she was deeply moved by his witness um and people of my age uh, know endlessly those people who were converted through billy graham's uh, crusades now the church of england didn't like it at the time um the english didn't like it they laughed at it they were very uncomfortable but the effect of billy graham's crusades kept kept Christianity going in this country for that generation. George Carey famously upset people by saying, you know, remember the church is only one generation away from dying out completely. Um, and although that's that's a colourful way of talking, it isn't, it's, it's true. So now, um, with the Church of England in the state that it's in, with uh, with the numbers that it has and the demographic time bomb it has, uh, you would think that people would be, any diocese, any part of the country would be very keen to get pretty well any kind of respectable help to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. So Franklin Graham is coming to Blackburn and the situation was that the first people who stood up and said, we don't want him here, ban him, was the Muslim Council of Great Britain. They were followed by LGBT Christians who said, we don't want him here either, ban him. Uh, a number of churches, the Methodists in particular said, we want nothing to do with this, we're pulling out. And he's divisive. The gospel is divisive. Who knew that the gospel was divisive? <laughs> this, is, this is new territory, brand new ground. <laughs> <laughs> but one hope, one hope was that, that um, evangelicals, particularly in the Church of England, have said, um, we have one conservative evangelical bishop left, and he's the bishop um, of Blackburn, Julian Henderson, and we can look to him to stand up for the gospel Christian morality and biblical values. So what did Julian Henderson, it's coming to his diocese, he was invited. He was invited, of course, to um, to ask all his clergy and all his congregations to come and support and bring their friends to hear the gospel. And his response was to say, well, I'm not pulling out, but I'm not going either. I take a neutral view on this crusade and, I, and neither I nor my staff will be there. I'm and not <laughs> going, I'm boycotting, <laughs> therefore I'm taking a neutral position. Well, of course. <laughs> How English of him. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, and, and, I mean, one has to ask, you know, so, so Bishop Julian, how is evangelism in your diocese? You know, how many people are coming to Jesus? What, what kind of evangelistic programs do you have? And we know what the answer is. We know that, we know that they're doing very badly indeed. So it, it's, it's really, it's very hard indeed to see uh, um, somebody in whom conservative orthodox christians place a great deal of trust uh show uh, what well, you know cold feet mm -hmm. and uh, and back out it's not as if he's saying well you know frankly billy franklin graham is a bit divisive she's like you know we're going to have our own diocesan evangelism uh, rally and come to that instead you could you could but they're not doing it the kind, well it, it's interesting so um, frankly is it any surprise yeah. that the church of england uh, he's un unable to make new Christians. The old generation is dying out. It's in trouble. Yes, it is. Well, actually, the Archbishop of Canterbury has been on tour lately. I saw him in front of the United Nations, and I saw him recently uh, in front of Tuck. And uh, you know this, and I know this. I'm sure George knows this. The, the purpose of a wife is to keep a husband from having delusions of grandeur. <laughs> okay and uh mrs welby is not doing her job because i see uh, the archbishop up there uh you know and it looks like it's right out of 1984 preaching socialism and preaching you know re redistribution of wealth and raising taxes and you know there's nothing better than the government doing the work of the church and all we have to do is support the government and i support the unions and for me i'm just like i this is it's it's out of this world. I, I can't believe I'm seeing the head of a church doing this. 
uh, Franklin Graham wouldn't do this. Uh, he is highly political, but he would never uh, stand up and do something like this. I can't think of very many other, well, okay, there is Pope Francis. He would probably do this. But uh, I don't think it's the role, and this is my personal opinion, for people in charge of the church to uh, participate in such political uh, activism. I am I wrong, Bishop? Mm -hmm. Um, I agree with you completely. Okay. I, I've, I, I, I've been thinking about this the whole of my life. Uh, I, I, I really always, Kevin, when I was younger, I wanted to be cool. I mean, a cool Christian, cool. you know, a cool, a cool priest. And um, uh, if there was an opportunity to be cool, I was really interested in it. So when liberation theology came along, I went, hey, you know, that's cool. That's I, pretty cool. I, I'd like to understand liberation <laughs> theology. And um, I, I used to read quite a lot about Marxism and the interaction of Marxism and mm -hmm. Christianity because I thought, well, this would be cool. Um, I'd quite like to be a liberation theologian. But but as time went by, the whole liberation theology thing turned out to be a complete disaster. It didn't work. Um, as time has gone by, it becomes clearer and clearer that, that for bishops and archbishops, um, one of the things they need to do is be a focus of unity. And there is no unity politically or economically amongst Christians. People have their, their different views. The moment a bishop or even a priest dives in to, uh, on, on economic issues, he runs the risk of alienating the whole of the rest of the body of Christ. So you'd have to be absolutely certain you had it from God, you should do this, or you split the church in two. Sure. I don't believe... Justin Welby has it from God that he needs to preach socialism and therefore and he's splitting the church in two. But he, he's decided he wants to do it. I, my own view of socialism is that it's a kind of uh, third rate secular version of Christianity. In other words, it, it says some very nice things about human nature. It, it, it invites people to be kind and good, uh, uh, to produce a state that will kind of institutionalize kindness or goodness. But there are two problems. One is it has never worked. And the other problem is that even when we try and do this as Christians in the life of the spirit, you need the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, you can just about carry it off. With the Holy Spirit, you can just about give away your goods. You can just about forgive your enemies. You can just about offer people hospitality under your roof who need it. But but you, without the Holy Spirit, you can't do it. And you certainly can't do it as a secular political program. You end up by forcing people, by taking their money or by coercing them. Hey. So for a bishop, archbishop, to stand up and say, let us go down the route of economic and political coercion to make people nice, I think is 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 theological shallowness of a of a reprehensible kind. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a, a commercial they play every once in a while, especially around Christmas here in America, where this lady has set up her Facebook wall and she's putting pictures on a wall, uh, a literal wall, and she goes, "There, there's my Facebook wall. I'm going to share it with everybody." And her friends are like, "You're not doing it right. That's not how it's done. You're not doing it right." Archbishop of Canterbury, you're not doing it right. It's not how it's done. You are in charge of a church. The church is to evangelize. The church is to uh, disciple, uh, to make Christians, to, make, uh, to help them maintain healthy spiritual lives, to participate, obviously, in the community, uh, to participate in the government, but not the way you want to participate in the government. If you want to have people uh, giving, and uh, doing all the things, I recommend you look up Fruits of the Spirit. It's what happens when you evangelize and you bring people into uh, a Christ community. They, they start to, to uh, evolve to a place where they're, they're living in the fruits of the Spirit, so that they are giving and they're charitable, they're joyous, loving, patient, kind. All the things you want the government to make people do can be done if you do it differently by working in people's lives, not in the life of the government through people, you're doing it the opposite, Archbishop. I'm sorry to say this, but that's just my humble capitalist Christian. You know, I think I was baptized a capitalist, but whatever. That's my humble, <laughs> <laughs> my humble Christian yeah, opinion is you're doing it wrong. I, I think for myself, I'm aware that, that my attempts to be socially relevant were flawed. Mm -hmm. Because what society wanted to do and to achieve is not the kingdom of heaven. That's right. So to be relevant to a society that is not doing the kingdom of heaven is probably not the Christian way. Uh, the harder way, of course, 
is to do evangelism. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to do evangelism and and uh, Welby says at one point to the to the trade union leaders I, I I have a dream he began to ape Martin Luther King it was really quite embarrassing I, I, I ha he had a number of dreams yeah. and uh, one of his dreams was that the um, that his his political rejuvenation would 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 get rid of the church doing food banks I think the church doing food banks is the most wonderful thing because it means that the poor will be fed by Christians. Yeah. Why would you want to get rid of the church feeding the poor with the love of Christ? Because it might then begin a relationship of, of, of mutual trust where you could tell them about Jesus. Why would you want the state to take people away from Christian charity? When, when we know, if you like, the, la the history of the last 200 years is that the, the church did all the charitable things. It did education, it did hospices, it did hospitals, it, it did medicine, it did teaching, uh, it did feeding the poor and clothing the poor. And when the church, when the state took over to do it less well... Much less um, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the church's opportunities of talking and loving and showing its love in action were diminished. Why would an archbishop want the church no longer to feed the poor? Mm -hmm. I, I just think he's got it completely wrong. And I think like the younger me, He's settling for being socially relevant because I think it's easier than doing evangelism. Well, it, it is clearly easier. It's clearly making him the cool Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, obviously something he wants to be, but it's not growing the church. I, I dare say in 10 more years, we're going to see 1% of young people identify uh, within the Church of England. It, it, it's not going to go up because... Justin Welby just made the Church of England irrelevant. There's no need for the church as long as the government can do it. Mm. You know, if we can just get the government to, to baptize the babies and conduct the funerals at the <laughs> end and hand out marriage licenses, what the hell is the point of the church? <sighs> I, I, I don't want to express anger, but I, I feel anger. Well, we, we're, we're, we're at a very serious point in the life of Christendom. Yeah. Christianity, the, 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 the narrative of Jesus, uh, people who are willing to talk about Jesus and live for Jesus and, and sacrifice their life and pay the price of discipleship. As, as, as Bonhoeffer talked about the cost of discipleship, um, the, the life, the words of Jesus are being wiped out from the public space. There are very few spaces now where you can talk about the gospel without someone coming along and asking the police to arrest you or shut you up. Even the, even the staff of St. Paul's Cathedral <laughs> asked to have the man who read out the Bible on their front porch shut up. So, um, the, 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 but if people don't hear about Jesus, uh, then Christianity will disappear. And there's no doubt at all of that. At the moment, the, the trajectory is for, is for Christianity to, to, to virtually be wiped out within the next generation in Great Britain. Um, now, there are things we can do about that. I, I, I think probably um, the, uh, the Rob Dreher Benedict option, Christians going... Uh, recapitulating underground and, and, and in networks may very well be a strategy we have to begin to adopt. We have we have to take into to, um, uh, uh, our cognizance that there can be far fewer Christians. Society is going to make us drive us out of the public sphere. And how do we do church? I, I think it's going to be a catacomb thing. And people say to me, "Well, don't be so miserable and so defeatist." I'm not being miserable or defeatist. I'm, I'm looking for a way of gathering the church together so that, that, um, that the people who want to talk about Jesus and evangelize and create Christian community and worship the Lord in integrity and truth can find each other. Because at the moment, that's not what the Church of England is about. You know, I think the Church of England needs what hap what's happening right now in China. China is clamping down on anybody who believes anything and this persecution of the Christians is really solidifying the faith uh, for the underground church. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, pastors unifying together uh, uh, and trying to oppose the government in this. And it's interesting. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of the Church of England, where they're trying to be to assimilate with the government, to be assimilated by the government. Uh, hopefully, uh, we have time next week to talk more about the uh, the, the underground church in China. Um, We've hit our time limit. Uh, we really appreciate people sitting around and listening to us. Uh, if you like this episode, I wrote it down. Click like. 
we're on YouTube or on Facebook there's a, a thumbs up button you click it and you've you proved you like us even if you don't like us click the button be a rebel share us uh, some people I, I see on Facebook share every episode there's about five of you you are the best friend of this program <laughs> all right we love you we pray for you uh, you're wonderful the the other 2,000 people who are afraid to share it and don't want to admit they watch it shame on you if you want to comment or correct us the place to go is the YouTube channel click on the episode and go in there uh, every week we make a small little itty bitty error somewhere in unscripted you're welcome to to, uh, to point it out to us if you're not subscribed to the program click the subscribe button so you can get instant updates when there's a new episode if you're really modern and you don't hang out on Facebook you don't hang out on YouTube we have a podcast in the show notes on YouTube, you can uh, sign up and subscribe to the podcast. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been patiently sharing and listening to episode 435 of Anglican Unscripted. Archbishop, you're just not doing it right. You're not doing it right. You're not. Oh. <laughs>